on the vlog again. Just can't wait to do a vlog again. The life I love is making vlogs for my friends. And I can't wait to do a vlog again. Doing a vlog again. Going places that I've never been. Seeing things that I may never see again. And I can't wait. Hello everyone and welcome back to The Top Vloggers. As always, I am your host, Hi and Mighty Joe, hanging out with... Your co-host, the lovely cat. And boy, we have a great vlog for you today. You can join us on all of our social media websites, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at The Top Vloggers. Also, if you'd like to help us reach the top, you can do so by going to www.patreon.com backslash The Top Vloggers. Without your help and support, these vlogs would be almost impossible to do. There will be a link in the description below. And if you are new here, you can hit that subscribe button, take it one step further, and ring the notification bell to keep you up to date on all the future adventures that will be going on on our channel. So let's get going. Today's vlog brings us to the Center for History in North Manchester, Indiana. Let's go inside, take a look around, and see what they have. Rising from its source near Huntertown, the Eel River flows southwest 110 miles into the Wabash River. The Miami called it Kanapanakmaka, their word meaning snakefish. A rich resource for food, transportation, and trade, uh, the Eel River was a thoroughfare through the wilderness. Take a look at this. They have some wonderful artifacts in here. and This tells you a little bit more about the early life of the, real, of the uh, Eel River Valley. Over 700,000 years, as many as four glaciers has covered the northern Wabash County. Uh, they receded as the earth warmed uh, 10,000 years ago. The Wisconsin ice sheet was the last of these glaciers shaping the landscape as we know it is today. And they even have this beautiful mural up on this wall. I wish I could get it all in one shot, but I can't. But it is just beautiful to show you what the Eel River Valley looked like. Drilling a water source well can put up in close touch with Indiana's geological past and the great glaciers that once covered the ice. So check all this out. Get another shot going the other direction. There we go. Check that out. Absolutely beautiful. Now this is a diorama uh, that was made by an art major at Manchester College in 2010. You can check out all this. That is very awesome. Check that out. Now these are all parts of a mastodon. This is the hip right here. And then up here are some of the ribs. And right here is a vertebrae. And then right over here is the thoracic vertebrae. Um, now the big bones uh, was discovered the 28th of August 1872 by Marcus Scott, Amos Nye, Jacob Stevenson and others. The men were digging a ditch for the purpose of draining a marsh on Mendenhall land two miles West of Lincoln, uh, 120 bones were discovered, 33 ribs, 40 spine, uh, 10 foot bones, and the femur weighed over 30 pounds and was 36 inches in length. You can check this out. This is what their feet is. 
Now here is the tusk right here. Look how big that thing is. That thing is huge. Juan the Mastodon. Right there is a tooth. Mastodon tooth molar. Boy. And this thing would have been huge. You can see the beautiful mural that they have put up here as well for this exhibit. Right here. Look how big that thing is. It's amazing. Now these are just some of the animals that they uh, have in this part. You can see the porcupine and the skunk and the badger. There's a beautiful coyote. The red fox. That's truly beautiful. Get a close up of that. Something you don't see every day, that's for sure. And this is more about the settlers and things like that. Here's some of the, the weapons that they may have had and a meat hook and a wedge, a beaver trap. And you see the coyote skins, the elk skins, muskrat, raccoon, bison. Possum, some of the jewelry that they would have had at that time. Very beautiful. Now, following the harvest of corn, beans, and squash, families would leave their village to hunt deer, uh, like the one that we're showing you today, uh, and small game. Uh, nothing was wasted. Deer and wild turkey were major sources of meat. Uh, for the Miami and the Potawatomi Indians. So, deer hide was used for clothing and moccasins. Uh, turkey feathers were used to uh, stabilize their arrows, make blankets. As, as well as uh, decoration uh, for uh, ceremonial uh, ceremonial clothing and things like that so you can see this old map of Indiana definitely uh, definitely beautiful and, and they have it all done with murals all the way around it's definitely very beautiful. Now over here is a log structure uh, which were used uh, uh, to build cabins and things like that. And this is uh, what their cabin would have looked like. Let's see if we can get a different view here. There's, you can see their bed and there would have been their fireplace over there and it's where they would have kept all their tools and pots and pans and things like that. Not a very big place, that's for sure, but they had all their necessities right here. Gaps between the logs uh, were used, were usually filled with uh, scraps of wood uh, creating the hewing process. And this cabin was built by Jerry Bollinger in 2016 and assembled with assistance from the Manchester High School football team. Now, a common practice for finishing a log house was to apply a lath and plaster uh, to the interior walls and a clapboard siding to the exterior. Uh, once finished in this manner, there was no apparent evidence of a log structure uh, within the walls. And here are some photos of them uh, 
building it and putting it together. As you can see, you can see the hay fork, a wooden rake, an old cross cut saw, a wedge, a hatchet, all kinds of different things. A double bitted axe. All kinds of old tools. A handheld corn shower. Now this is a millstone, which we've seen one of these before in one of our rather previous vlogs. Uh, when we went out to the uh, Stockdale Mill, we saw one of these. But this millstone is uh, from the Harder's Mill. Uh, in 1839, Joseph Harder uh, built and operated one of North Manchester's first industries. Uh, the Harder Water Powered Grist Mill was located on the north bank of the Ill River east of the Wabash Road Bridge. Uh, these millstones ground corn and other grain from area farms uh, before there was a local grist mill. Area settlers uh, had to travel 40 miles by horseback to the nearest mill which was on Turkey Creek in Elkhart County. In 1835, this round trip would have taken a week. And here's a what the old mill looked like. And here are some of the stones from it. Now here they're talking about the prehistoric American Indian uh, the projectile points and tools that they would have had. Check out some of these things that they have here. They have spear points. They have a scraper right there. Or a scrapper. Oh, they have all kinds of cool things. Look at the, some, how big some of these were. They really did get pretty big yeah that, that's a cup stone unknown date on that that one's from anywhere from 300 BC to 380 right there that north blade some very very cool things Now here is a list of businesses uh, that were here in North Manchester uh, prior to 1950. That's kind of cool. Take a look at that. Now the North Manchester Foundry Company uh, at 205 Wabash Road, the foundry was originally organized to make castings for the Peabody Seating Company uh, in early 1930. Uh, the foundry began to manufacture coal burning, heating, and laundry stoves. During World War II, they produced farm machinery castings. Uh, the foundry was the first in the area to offer group insurance in 1929, profit sharing in 1935, vacation pay in 1944, and holiday pay in 1950. All innovative at the time, uh, the stove was used, uh, the, this stove was used in the Wendell's uh, decor shop as a Christmas decoration. And speaking of the Peabody Seating Company, they used to make chairs and desks. So if you remember having desks like this, uh, this one right here says 1956. And then this one says 1958. This one was 1958 as well, 1968, and we had chairs like that in our high school. So totally awesome to see this. 
And then this is an aerial photograph of the Peabody Seating Company in 1956. Take a look at that. You can see it was quite a big factory. You see right here on the on the side of that it says Peabody Seating Company. Now here is the Peabody family. You have James and Estelle. And then you have Thomas, Mary, Mary M and Mary K. And then here are some of the old, there's the first gang of workers right there. This is what the factory looked like in 1903. And it didn't look a whole lot different in 1908. Oh, now this is interesting. You have different milk cartons and jugs and stuff in here. What looks to be baby bottles here. Well, here you can see different kinds of bonnets. Personally, I've never wore hats. But this is the Manchester Bonnet Company. The company was mainly an employer of mostly women and specialized in made-to-order bonnets and prayer coverings that were worn by members of the Church of the Brethren. The bonnets were shipped by mail all over the United States. Really neat looking bonnets and how they accessorized them. Now this desk right here, it was uh, donated by John Warren, but it happened to be the desk uh, that belonged to Judge John Comstock. Now, John Comstock, uh, Comstock was the builder of Liberty Mills. Uh, in 1836, John Comstock uh, came to Liberty Mills, and a Mr. McBride sold the land to him, transferring transferring with it the obligation McBride had made to James Abbott to build a mill. Uh, Comstock did build the mill. He was a man of great uh, enterprise and fine business qualifications. He was at one time uh, the proprietor of a sawmill, a grist mill, a distillery store, uh, and carding mill. So quite a bit, quite a different things. In 1846, he was elected probate judge of Wabash County, and in 1858, he was the representative for this county in the state legislature. In about 1855, he introduced the first herd of shorthorn cattle into the county, and in the years uh, that followed, his, he actively uh, engaged in breeding of the stock. So there you go. Now right here is the W.C. Douglas Sawmill. Uh, it was a southeast corner of 300 east and 900 north Servia. Uh, many men were employed as timber buyers, cutters, haulers, and sawmill workers. Uh, they cut lumber for loaded that was loaded on flat cars and transported by railroad. Douglas purchased large tracts of wooded area, uh, felled and hauled trees to Servia uh, by mule wagons. And in 1890, a string of 32 teams passed through North Manchester loaded with logs. Now right here we have a picture of John Wesley Strauss, um, otherwise known as J.W. in 1840, uh, Peter Strauss and his wife uh, immigrated from Germany 
and settled in Stark County, Ohio, a few years prior to the Civil War, uh, Daniel Strauss, one of their sons who had learned the miller's trade in Ohio, came to Liberty Mills uh, to be the miller in the old Comstock Mill, uh, which we talked about earlier. The Civil War broke out, and Daniel served three years and three months in the Union forces. Uh, after the war, he was miller in the mills at Liberty Mills, Largo, uh, and Laketon. And right there you can see, and then afterwards, uh, in 1914, uh, his son was admitted into partnership, and the firm was renamed J.W. Strauss and Son. In 1917, the one-horse wagons were replaced with trucks. The family business passed through the panics of 1873 and 1893. Uh, through the money corner in 1907, the buyer's strike of 1921, and the Great Depression of 1929 to 1934, the uh, Strauss family businesses were committed to the policy of honest merchandising and fair values with a sense of responsibility to the community as distributors of commodities. And there you can see the son with former vice, former president Richard Nixon. Now this car right here, uh, which is made by the DeWitt Company, uh, was used in the Broadway Place Showboat. Uh, this vehicle is battery operated, four person, a four person touring car, uh, built by Russell Egoff and Steve Faringer, uh, and is on loan to the Center for History. This vehicle. Uh, style was never produced by the original DeWitt Motor Company uh, but is reminiscent of similar autos produced in the 1910s. You can take a look at that. It says right there, it says the DeWitt Motor Company which was right here in North Manchester at one point in time. Right there is the home of Blackmore Cigar Company. There was at one point in time five uh, cigar companies or manufacturers here in North Manchester. This is a replica of the building. In 1920, uh, cigar manufacturer Carl Morris moved his family to North Manchester with 20 years of experience in cigar making in Seattle and Boston. Morris. <coughs> Morris wanted to promote North Manchester as a uh, cigar Center. Uh, his cigar factory was located at 108 East Main Street in a tall three-story building on the alley. Uh, peak production during the 1920s to 1922 was 1,000 cigars a day. The Blackmore brand uh, was based on the name of the 19th century novelist. Uh, today the Blackmore cigar brand or band and box labels are rare collectibles. Born in 1879 to Russian Jewish parents in the Ukraine, Carl Morris migrated to America in 1883. Well, I think that's going to do it for us here today. Don't forget to come back tomorrow where we come back for part two. It should be fun, educational, and exciting. It really is educational. Children love coming here. Uh, it, I had a, I had a, tr uh, a tremendous fun, uh, a blast learning everything, uh, and I definitely love the murals like the one that we're standing in front of. Uh, just a, a wonderful place, and if you ever get a chance to uh, 
check out the Center for History in North Manchester, Indiana. I would recommend that you do it. It is a very beautiful place. Don't forget to come back tomorrow where we come back for part two. We'll see you then. Until then, top vloggers out.